Our first speaker is Yves Pamier. He's the uh, chief of the development or therapeutic branch. He got his MD and PH degrees from the University of Paris. He's been at NIH since 1981. And he's co-chair of the discovery committee for the NCI Experimental Therapeutics Program. He's also a member of the NCI Developmental Therapeutics Program. And he's an editor for cancer research. And he's received numerous awards, such as the Paul Ehrlich Award. And his title today is Topo Isomerases. Eves. OK, thank you. So I don't think this is what's going to happen to you. You're not just going to relax and unwind totally. <laughs> but that's what the topo isomerases do, because uh, uh, in the genome, you have a lot of processing enzymes. Uh, the d genome needs to be open to be transcribed and to be replicated. And this is done by helicases, so they will separate. But when you separate the DNA strands, as a consequence, you actually over-tighten the DNA helices, and now that needs to be relaxed uh, by the topoisomerases. Uh, there are a number of reviews uh, that you could read uh, from us. There are others, obviously. Uh, you could go back, and many of the slides that I took are from these reviews, so you could just go back to the reviews if you wish to do so. Uh, they each have a different angle, so the, this one in 20 tail was mostly on the biology, uh, probably could be updated now, but the drugs remain the same, both for cancer and for infectious disease. Same here, there was an update actually three years later on the on, on drugging topoisomerases and what we could do better and what we have learned from that. And the most recent review which I wrote with uh, uh, John Nittis at University of Chicago, and John and I have worked on topoisomerase for um, many, many years. Uh, John on topo 2 and myself on topo 1, and two uh, very talented uh, younger persons, Yirun Sun and, and uh, Naomi Wang. Both are in my lab at this time, so if you wanted to talk topoisomerase, you could come to building 37, and uh, they'll give you a lot of information. There's also a book in the library, so I'm proud of having been the editor of one book, but having done one, I will not do a second because it's a lot of work. <laughs> but I was very pleased because my colleagues all said yes initially, so I got all my chapters and so on. Maybe in five years from now when I have forgotten how painful it was. But in the end, it's, it's nice to have something somewhere with all the, all the, the people and all the knowledge. <clears throat> So what are the problems and what are the enzymes? Uh, the problem of DNA is DNA is a double helical. Uh, it's a double strand, and it's not as, uh, it's not as uh, flexible as one would wish. It's like even that cable, you, know, you can't turn it around. It's, it's kind of it's stiff. So what happens is when you, it makes supercars, like you know what you see in your bag when you put your, your battery charger or your iPhone uh, wire, it, you'll take it out of the bag and you're going to get super coils and you get things like that. So the, one of the solutions to these super coils, like you overwind or underwind the DNA, it's positively when it's overwound and uh, it is negatively super coiled when it's underwound, the topoisomerases will adjust that and all of them will do it. So there are six and all of them will deal with that relaxation problem. That's probably why the first slide is appropriate. They all relax DNA. But some of the topo do more. You know, topo 2s, uh, alpha and beta, there are two topo 2s, can what we call decatenate. So when you have uh, actually rings that are intertwined like this, uh, topo 2 can open one and then do this and let it go. And it could do the opposite. So it's called catenation or circle, uh, so decatenates. At the end of replication, DNA is catenated. So it needs to be decatenated. Topo 2 is absolutely essential for that. But DNA also makes knots. So within a single molecule, actually, it could end up being knotted. And the topo 2, because it could pass the strand, will unknot the DNA and could actually knot 
So in addition to relaxation, Topo 2 could do more. He could decatenate, catenate, not, or not. And then there's another group of topos, such as the topo 3s, that can resolve these, uh, what we call holiday, holiday junctions, uh, which happen at the, during replication. Uh, you could have, or recombination, you have these holiday junctions. And these are resolved especially by topo 3 alpha. And in 2013, uh, topo 3 beta, which was left sort of behind in the field, uh, was first described in 1990. Not very many people worked on it, but in, uh, I will describe a little more later. In, in 2013, it was found to be an RNA topo isomerase. So now what's happened is the topo isomerase is not only dealing with DNA, but also with RNA. And RNA can form knots, long RNA molecules, and it could form catenates. You could form two RNA molecules, could actually have two loops intertwined. And you need to resolve that. Topo 3 beta will do that. So what I will do is I'll first introduce the topos. Uh, they're conserved throughout all the organisms that have DNA, have topo isomerases. So if you take sort of two examples, the humans. So in humans, there are six topos, and they are divided in three groups. And the numbering system is based on historical. It's like the NIH, building one was the first building, and building 50 is a built later. So all chronologically, the topos were the same. Topo ones were first discovered, then the topo two, and then the topo threes. But they're still grouped in, in two main groups, the type one and type two. And to make it simple, type one cleaves one strand of DNA, type two cleaves two strands. So that makes it quite easy to remember. Type one, one strand, type two, two strands. So in humans, you get a four type ones, and there are the two topo one, topo threes, and two type twos, topo 12 and beta. In E. coli, they are two type ones, topo one and topo three, so it keeps one strand of DNA at a time. And you have more type twos because you have gyrase and you have topo four. But in E. coli, there is no top one B. So we'll understand at the end what the difference is for the top one B. What's interesting for medicine, in addition to biology, is these enzymes are targets of very widely used agents for cancer or for infectious disease. Top one is the anti-cancer targets of drugs used routinely in the clinic, the camptotensin. Uh, top two is the target of anti-cancer agents very widely used, etoposide, doxorubicin, mitoxantron. And topo four and gyrase in bacteria is the target of the bacterial. So you all know cyprofloxacin or floxacin. These are quinolones. They target the topo twos in the bacteria, but not in the host. So they are specific antibacterial drugs. So in human, going back, you get six enzymes divided in three groups. And the difference between each of these enzymes is the way they deal with DNA. So I told you the type one, cleave one strand of DNA at a time, type two, two strands. So type two, cleave two strands. The cleavage is made by a staggered cut, four base pair stagger, but one on each strand is a homodimer. And the enzyme then cleaves the DNA that way. The inhibitors block the enzyme, etoposide or doxorubicin, by binding at the DNA interface. We'll come back to that. And in the type one, there are two types, depending where the topo cleaves the DNA and attaches to the DNA. So the type one, let's go to type 1A first. They cleave DNA one strand by attaching to the five prime end. You see, this is the five prime end. Like the topo two, it's attached to the five prime end. But the topo 1B attached to the three prime end. And that's why they are differentiated between top 1B and top 1A. So the A enzyme attached to the five prime end, they are catalytic tyrosyl. The B enzyme attached to the three prime end. So going back, another way to look at this. So these are, for your information, the chromosome location of all of these enzymes uh, in, in humans, the proteins and their size. So they are fairly large proteins. Uh, the topo one work as monomer, 
and the topo 2 has dimer so that becomes very large machine because 170 times 2 is 340 it's about the size of a nucleosome very large these are their location and these are the drugs so you see some of the enzymes actually do not have drugs uh, that are associated and useful for therapy and i think there is still room to actually make good drugs for this enzyme now, if you think of a human cell, the genome is divided in two parts. 95% of your genome, or mine, is in the nucleus. But bear in mind that 5%, and in the heart, for example, where there are lots of mitochondria, uh, part of your genome is in your mitochondria. And this genome comes from your mother only. So uh, the mother and father genome is in your nuclear genome, but mitochondrial genome is only from your mother. Uh, it's about 5%. These genomes are, uh, you, you take top isomerases. So if you take top one, it's only nuclear. Top 3B is only nuclear. But top 1MT is only mitochondrial. And some of the others are actually in both uh, compartments. Top 2 alpha, top 2 beta, top 3 alpha are both in nuclear and mitochondrial genome. And the specific repair enzyme for the topo 2s, which we'll describe at the end, are actually in both compartments. So the whole genome, nuclear and mitochondrial genome, uh, are handled by the nuclear and mitochondrial genome by the topoisomerases. And any imbalance of these topoisomerases will be source of genomic instability. Not only is useful to treat uh, diseases, but it's also when it's not appropriate source of genomic instability. So I'll divide in three. We'll talk about the topo ones first. We'll then talk about topo twos and then the topo three. So in the topo one, I've told you there are two topos. Uh, top one, nuclear top one, we just call it top one. And top one MT, which we discovered uh, and we decided to call it top one MT, not top one uh, prime or whatever, because we didn't want to change the name. So Hugo agreed, uh, it's quite marvelous. This, so it's called top one MT because it's only mitochondrial. So the way the topo 1 will work, so I put the topo 2 here, the topo 1 will, in fact, most of it is probably bound to DNA, and <clears throat> periodically it will actually cleave the DNA, one of the strands, and re-ligate the DNA. So it's always nicking and closing the DNA, and most of the time it's non-productive. And during its closing re-ligation reaction, uh, if the DNA supercoil, it will enable the relaxation. So the cleavage reaction, which is described here in more detail, operates by the action of a tyrosine residue on the enzyme, which when it's brought in proximity to the phosphodiester of the DNA, will generate a three prime phosphodiester bond. That will generate the cleavage of the DNA, and it's reversible because when the DNA realigns, the 5' hydroxyl can eliminate the topo. So that's why it's reversible. And this reaction is remarkably efficient. It works without ATP, doesn't require divalent metal, still works at zero degrees. So this enzyme is remarkably effective. And it's trapped by the camptotestins and other drugs that I will describe that are specific. And that's very different from the topo 2s which I had said cleave both strands linked to the 5 prime man, still by a tyrosyl, but this tedious reaction uses ATP for topo 2, requires magnesium, doesn't work at zero degrees, and the drugs are different. So on each side, you have different drugs for topo 1 and for topo 2. So what does really topo 1 do? So it was discovered by Jim Shampoo and, uh, and Jules Beko. So uh, and they initially called it uh, the DNA uh, um, unwinding enzyme, DNA unwinding, because they took a cell extract from murine cells and added to supercoiled plasmid and discovered that the DNA was magically relaxed very effectively without magnesium, without ATP. And then this was purified as being topo 1, the DNA unwinding enzyme, and now it's well known that the way it does it is by making a nick in the DNA and dissipating the supercoil, letting the DNA rotate around the break and then uh, re-ligating the DNA. And topo 1 is actually essential. 
It's essential because as the DNA is transcribed or replicated, anytime you accumulate supercoil, you need to relax the supercoil and topo one is coupled with RNA and DNA polymerases. And in, in, in mouse, you cannot knock it out. And in human, I think it's absolutely essential. But in yeast, you can. Yeast can survive with a topo one. It uses topo two and topo three, but not higher eukaryotes. So if you take the paradigm of a, a transcription machine or replication machine that unwinds DNA, in front of the moving polymerase that opens the DNA, you generate positive supercoil, meaning you tighten the, the helix. And at some point, if you don't relax, you're going to get stuck. So the topos will enable the dissipation of the positive supercoil, enabling the movement of the RNA and DNA topo isomerases. On the other hand, behind, you generate negative supercoil. DNA is actually opened up, and that could create R loops or uh, alternative DNA structures. So if you do not relax DNA with topo, you create a lot of problems. The transcription stalls, replication stalls, generate R loops, generates a lot of alternative DNA structures. So the topo are always balancing this supercoiling. And that's what's happened. DNA supercoiled in a supercoiled domain. The topo will then magically relax that. The DNA is relaxed. The polymerases can move on. Now, what the way the drugs work is they interfere with the nicking closing reaction. They let the DNA being broken open, and that generates DNA damage. This is not only due to drugs, but also to DNA lesions. So in addition to drugs, which were huge for chemotherapy, the topoisomerase 1 cleavage complexes are also very frequently induced, namely in neuron, for example, by oxidized base, oxidized stress, DNA lesions. And if topoisomerase gets on damaged DNA, it actually gets stuck. And that's even worse. And that's why every cell has a DNA repair machinery for topoisomerase. A little bullet point here about DNA supercoiling. Uh, the idea is that in the context of chromatin, where the rotation of DNA is constrained, DNA supercoiling, which is over supercoiling and under twisting or right, is readily generated. If you remove a nucleosome, you immediately generate one and a half turn of negative of uh, negative supercoil. So each time you make a nucleosome, you absorb negative supercoil. But as you take nucleosomes away, you produce negative supercoil. So everything is in equilibrium, and top one and top one MT remove supercoiling by untwisting DNA, acting as swivelets. Whereas the topo two, topo two alpha and beta remove the right. I mean, when the strands are being crossed. It could pass them across. Like you're, if you're in a shower and you, your, your thing is twisted, you have two ways to go. You could just turn it. So that's what topo one will do. Or you just pass it around. That's what topo two will do. Uh, so the basic fact is positive supercoil tightens the DNA helix, whereas DNA negative supercoils facilitate the opening, which is good when you need to transcribe or initiate replication and generate single strain fragment. Nucleosomal formation or disassembly absorb or release supercoils. The polymerases generate positive supercoil ahead and negative supercoil behind their track. And excess positive supercoil arrest DNA tracking enzymes. And they block transcription elongation initiation. They destabilize nucleosomes. Negative supercoiling could be a good thing if you favor DNA melting to initiate replication and transcription to form D loops and to generate recombination and nucleosomal formation. You need to introduce negative supercoil. But if you have too much negative supercoil, then that facilitates the formation of alternative DNA structures, such as R loops, guanine, uh, G4, guanosine quadruplexes, which were discovered here in the, the NIH, right-handed DNA, ZDNA, and alternative structure, which then will absorb the negative supercoiling as they form and they will attract regulatory proteins. So all these things are in equilibrium in the genome, and the topos are cross-talking with all this. So the two topo ones, the canonical nuclear topo one is a 765 amino acid protein. When we discovered top one MT with Ong Yang Zhang, uh, we uh, initially found parts on another chromosome and then sequenced it and ended up finding a mitochondrial targeting sequence 
that replaces the nuclear localization sequence. So all um, uh, vertebrates have two topo one, the, uh, two different chromosomes, the mitochondrial nucle nuclear topo one. Yeast doesn't have two; it has one topo one. And we, during evolution, probably the duplication of the ancestral topo one gene we think of happened at the chordates, and then it became two topo one. Uh, topo one B also found in some bacteria. Uh, and in some viruses, like vaccinia virus and variola virus, have their own topo one, which is an abbreviated version of topo, and it works the same, just relaxes DNA. So some words about the uh, use uh, of drugs that target topo isomerase one. Camptotestines were discovered at the NIH, um, at the NCI, as effective anti-leukemic drug when they were using murine models. The drug was purified, identified. It was from the extract of a Chinese tree, Camptotheca acuminata, <clears throat> and that's why the drug was called Camptotestin. As the drug was discovered, derivatives that are water-soluble were made, and in the year 2000, two were approved in the uh, United States, Topotican, a water-soluble Camptotestin derivative, and Irinotican, which is a prodrug, with this water-soluble group, which with active intermediate is called SN38. This is the active metabolite. Today, in South Korea, there is another derivative which has been approved. It's not in the United States. It's called Belotican. It's another water-soluble derivative. The way these drugs work is they uh, very selectively, highly selectively block topoisomerase 1. So, as topo 1 gets on DNA and cleaves and religates all the time in this uh, nicking closing cycle, the drug sneak at the interface of the enzyme and the DNA. And nature is selected this drug beautifully to just do this. They bind very selectively at this interface. And we discovered initially this notion that they were very selective because the base sequence preference was highly specific. It was very, very biased for having a thymine at minus one and a guanine at plus two, uh, at plus one, minus one and plus one. And the crystal structure showed that when you have a topoisomerase one DNA complex, so topo one is in gray, the DNA is in green, and when the drug is in the complex, you see it's bound exactly here at the interface of the enzyme and the DNA. And nature has selected this drug to only do this. It has all the chemical characteristics to do it. Only one of the natural stereoisomer is active, the S isomer. The R is not. When we looked at the R isomer, it was not active. So it's highly specific for blocking and trapping. So the notion of trapping an enzyme was born with the topoisomerase. So when you heard this term trapping, it was actually first coined to describe the action of topoisomerase inhibitors. Something that's been forgotten, which I now remember because homologous recombination is such an important part of, of biology and therapeutics, and for polydp ribose polymerase inhibitor, we're all aware of the importance of BRCA1 and homologous recombination deficiency. In fact, when I first, and we were all working on the camp to testing, we, disc, we, we found very early on the following. In 1988, Two paper came. One, when we're studying the camptotestin, this is not our work, but it was work done by yeast geneticists. Initially, yeast is very resistant to camptotestin. And you could have said, well, it's very trivial, it's because camptotestin doesn't get into yeast. But the yeast geneticist had one mutant, which is homologous recombination deficient, RAD52 deficient. And it was very obvious that this became very sensitive to camptotestin. So the argument the drug was not getting in was wrong. It was that yeast was able to repair very efficiently whatever camptotestin was doing. And this was not only one lab. There was a second lab uh, by Jim Wong found the same. You could see here, this is a wild type uh, RAD52 positive yeast, highly resistant to camptotestin. But as soon as you knock out RAD52, it became very sensitive. In fact, if you go back in history, and you have to give a fair share of which was the first drug that was 
uh, activity was determined by RAD50, by homologous drug combination, is actually the campotestin. They were the first drugs showing synthetic lethality in homologous recombination deficient cell. So this was now published in 1988, so we could look back at all this now with time. But it has practical implication today for, for medicine. So some years ago, we decided, because the campotestin were the only one, non topo one inhibitors, we decided to design at the NIH and the NCI and look for other topo one inhibitors that were not campotestins. And the reason was that the campotestins were effective uh, and topo one was validated. And because we know, and you all know, that drugs that have the same target could have very different clinical applications. For example, colchicine and vemblastin are both tubulin inhibitors. Molecularly, you could not tell the difference. But in a patient, you're not going to give colchicine to a cancer patient, and you're not going to give vemblastin to somebody who has gout. These drugs have very different applications. They have the same molecular target. So the argument that if you make another topo one inhibitor, it's likely to have a different clinical pharmacology. And we knew, as we looked at the campotestin, that they had limitation. Uh, Irinotecan produces very severe intestinal toxicity. Uh, they are substrate for drug efflux, but even worse, the campotestins, they are natural products, but they are not stable. Camptotestin as a alpha hydroxylactone, they are very unstable as physical pH. And as soon as you put them in solution at pH 7 or 7.4, they immediately undergo uh, this lactone ring opening, forming carboxylate, and in the blood, this bind to serum albumin. So the active form is a minority. So that's a really a problem. So we all knew this, but the drugs went on and they were approved. And then the other thing is when they bind to the topo one cleavage complex is they're not making a covalent intermediate. So they always come on and off, and so it's very transient the way they act with the topo one. So we decided to develop our own topo one inhibitors based on the argument that I've given you that the campotestin we knew what we're looking for. And now what we also know is the campotestins are BRCA drugs. So if we develop Topo one inhibitor, non gametotestin we could always think we could target the patient who are not responding to olaparib or to the PARP inhibitors now with topo one inhibitors that would be gametotestins and beyond. So we, the idea also, I've told you that gametotestins were the only class, and I've told you the, the limitations, the chemical instability, their reversibility, their drug efflux uh, substrates, so they could be eliminated by cancer cells as they overexpress the drug effect transporter, and also the campotestin have a very short plasma half-life, hours. And for patients, it's not great because you're going to get the topo targeting for a short time. They have do, uh, bone marrow tox and severe diarrhea. So the solution to the problem came to us. Uh, we've been working on this chemical series since uh, 1998. Uh, we put in the patent at the time and developed these drugs, which we call the adenoisoquinoline. And today, we'd say 20 years later, we have three drugs in the clinic that are called LMP400, adotecan, LMP776, imidotecan, and LMP744. So these are in the clinic now in building 10. And the latest study we did with this drug, which was just published, was to compare the uh, new drugs in an NCI-sponsored clinical trial, not only in humans, but in dogs. So what we did is we took uh, dogs uh, for, who had lymphoma, and all these clinics here were coordinated throughout the United States, and the dogs with lymphoma were treated. So this is what the NCI does, so you could go to the website so the owners would take their dogs to the clinic throughout the United States, and they were offered the opportunity to treat these dogs free of charge with any of these three drugs. And our goal was to determine the maximum tolerated dose, uh, to compare the activities, make sure which one was the best in these real model of tumors, determine the pharmacokinetics in blood and tumors, and it's much easier to do in dog trials than in human trials and do uh, target engagement with gamma H2X and top one down regulation. So 
this was done in collaboration with Amy LeBlanc here at NCI and James Dorosho, who is the translation director for the NCI. So we worked together for a long time. And these are the classical response curve. Each bar is a dog. And when it goes below, it means response. And the deeper, the more the response. And you can see that many of the dogs do respond to these drugs with their lymphoma. And one drug was clearly much better. It's this LMP744. And what is ironic in a way, we had not selected this drug for clinical trial because in mice, these two are better and this one is not very good. But in dogs, it was very good. So where we are now is that the two clinical adenoids, so quinoline, uh, andiotecan and imidotecan, have anti-tumor activity, so we, we, we expected that. But the third one, it was even better. The dose-limiting toxicity of this drug is very acceptable. They have bone marrow suppression, but there is no diarrhea. So for us, this is a win because irinotecan, again, is, is limited by diarrhea. These drugs did not produce diarrhea, whether in dog, in humans, or in mice. The pharmacokinetics is favorable. We're talking, uh, you know, 17, 11, or six hours versus a couple hours for the endenoisoquinoline. And the, the one we had not selected shows remarkable tumor retention. You could not do this in murine model. This is because of the dogs. We were able to do that. And then target is engaged. So as a result of this, this LMP744 is now, to, now back in building 10. So Jim Dorosho has put it back in patient in building 10, and we're looking at the phase one now to see what uh, the drug will be doing in humans. Now, if you think of cancer therapy, if you go back historically, the best cancer therapy, and today remain true, is the targeted therapy. What is targeted therapy for cancer? Is surgery. If you could take out the tumor, <laughs> the chances of success is great. This is the best targeted therapy. Next best targeted therapy is radiotherapy. But with chemotherapy, usually you don't really do targeted therapy. You do it based on molecular signatures, such as BRCA. But, but you're still giving the drug everywhere. So the best idea would be to do targeted delivery. And what is happening now with the topo isomerase inhibitor, at least with topo 1, and something which is sort of under the radar, is big companies and smaller companies have realized this. And they have taken the campotestines award warhead. And they attach these drugs to uh, delivery vectors that could be uh, 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 microsomes or, or liposomes, pegs, antibodies, antibodies targeted to different elements, such as HER2. This drug, for example, is doing beautifully. This is from Japan, Daichi Sancho. Uh, and patients with HER2 expressing tumors have very important responses, much better than the warhead free drug. So my hope is that these drugs for which we know the pharmacology, if we could deliver to the tumor with the right vector, clearly will make a difference. So I'll go to the topo 2 now. So there are two topo 2s in human um, and most vertebrates, uh, vertebrates I would say, top 2 alpha and beta, why 2? Well, because there is division of labor. And each gene needs to be expressed in different contexts. Topo 2 beta is the most ubiquitous. It's expressed in both replicating and differentiated cells and in uh, exponentially growing cells. It is absolutely critical for transcription, whereas top 2 alpha is very critical, essential for replication. It's highly expressed in replicating cells and cancer cells, such as breast cancer cells, uh, breast cancer, top 2 alpha is often amplified, and it helps cells to divide, whereas top 2 beta is the housekeeping topo 2. The two topos in humans are very similar. They are in different chromosomes, but they are very similar. Uh, they differ mostly in their C terminus, which is more variable, and probably they bind to different factors based on the, cert on the C terminus. The catalytic tyrosine is in the middle, and they are somewhat similar to bacterial, except in bacteria, like gyrase or topo 4, it's made in two parts. So you see in, in, in bacteria, instead of having one coding sequence, it's two, two different genes, gyrase A and gyrase B. And then for topo 4, you have par E and par C. 
So in human, it's dimers, topo 2 alpha dimer, topo 2 beta dimer. But in, in bacteria, it's a tetramer. It gyrates A, B, gyrates A, two unit, two unit gyrates B, and so on. But the, the biochemistry is very conserved. These, mo these enzymes are beautiful in the sense that they chelate two metal ions to actually approach the DNA. And when they approach DNA, the way they will work, they will work on, on crossover regions, mostly. So when you have two DNA duplexes that are next to each other, whether it's in the same molecule or whether it's just a catenate like this, it will do the same. You have two strands. One is duplex. One is the gate, and one is the transport. This is the convention. So the topo is, works like the NIH gates. You could not enter the NIH without closing the gate behind you. You cannot enter in one gate. So the DNA will only go through the other strand by the same principle. In the first principle, the top gate will open. It will let one strand go through. Once this is in the system, then the strand, the, 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 the gate strand, will be cleaved, letting the passage strand go through. Then it will go through. Then we'll rely gate behind and then the gate will let that go, and everything will close back with ATP. So it's, it's a two-gate system, or these three gates, if you wish, making sure the DNA passes through in both directions, depending on supercrawling for topo 2. And then that would be a very safe way to have done this very simple process, which is to take one strand, open, get through, go back. But it never goes open like this dangerously. It's always under control with the two gates. And this very efficient reaction does miraculous reaction. It can decatenate and catenate, not and unknot. It can relax supercoil. And uh, in, in for gyrase, it can also generate negative supercoiling. So this is a magnificent machine, in some ways, a magnificent dimer. It works in many processes in cells. So if you take transcription, for example, where you have here the RNA polymerase, you generate positive supercoiled ahead, as I said. This is released by topo 1 or topo 2 alpha and beta. Behind, you generate negative supercoil that could be relieved by topo 1 or topo 3 beta. But then topo 2 is also acting at the enhancer region. And then you have topo 2, the enhancers do that. So all these topos are taking care of the looping of chromatin, of the opening of chromatin, and making sure that the polymerases can do their job. So this is in this review, if you want to read more details. But during replication, it's the same problem. As you open the DNA, you generate positive supercoil ahead. Topo 1 can take that off. But behind, you could generate hemicatenanes or precatenanes. And this will be removed by topo 2. So the topos have a lot of, of interplay with replication and transcription that are absolutely essential. Now, the anti-cancer drug for topo 2 are listed here. On the top, you have the anti-cancer group. So these are the structures. You could appreciate yourself that chemically they are quite different, but they all have in common that planar aromatic moiety. So these are the uh, anti-cancer, etoposide, teniposide, doxorubicin, donorubicin, mitoxantrone, amsacrine, elliptisins, and TAS. On the bottom, these are the antibacterial. They are sh smaller ring systems, and they have these, you see, these diketo groups that has an interaction with the metal. And all these are the quinolones. Some names you will recognize, norfloxacin, superfloxacin, gemofloxacin, moxifloxacin. It's all variation on the same theme to overcome resistance and gain intellectual property. The topo2 inhibitor have in common the mechanism of action. They all bind when the DNA is cleaved. So this is a topo 2 dimer, and the DNA is barely visible in the middle, and the breaks will be on that piece of DNA. The drugs bind, like for the topo 1, in the cleavage site. And the reason the planar aromatic moiety, which is shown here, actually stacks with the base, like a sandwich. When the DNA opens, the bases are like this, and the drug falls in the middle, and by stacking, it just gets stuck. Non-covalently, but gets stuck. And so that's, for example, for etoposide with topo 2. 
But if you take gyrase or topo 4 for the quinolones, it's exactly the same. So I say it's a tetramer. It has the same shape with the NIH gate type 2 gates with the hole here. This is the DNA that is being broken. And you see the drug is bound exactly at the cleavage site, like in the lock of the door, just binding there. And here it is. And this is the contact with the metal. So same principle. That led to the idea that the topoisomerase inhibitors have a common mechanism of action, which we refer to as an interfacial inhibition, because the drugs bind at the interface of the DNA and of the topoisomerase. And this led to this notion of interfacial inhibition of macromolecular interaction. And that was a nature's paradigm for many toxins. Many toxins do that. And they target macromolecular complexes, because in nature, everything moves. And if you put a, like a little thing in the middle of two things that are moving, it's going to get jammed, and therefore you trap these macromolecular complexes. So in the case of TOPO1, to summarize, the trappings is because the drug binds at the enzyme DNA interface, making hydrogen bond specific for the enzyme, stacking against the base. That's true for the camptotestin and the endenoisoquinoline. And for the TOPO2, the stacking takes place also at the enzyme DNA interface with hydrogen bond with the enzyme, and that's true for the topo 2s. The topo 3s. So these are a bit of a newcomer. There is no drug associated with topo 3s, but they are very, um, very interesting, and especially for not only for cancer but also for neurosciences. So the topo 3 alpha is primarily involved in replication. So it's a DNA topoisomerase. The topo-3 beta is a transcription-associated enzyme. It's both a DNA and an RNA topoisomerase. For DNA, primarily works on R loops, more likely, and D loops. And for RNA, it works on RNA, uh, RNA nodes or RNA catenates. So the two enzymes, 2A, 3A, and 3B, in fact, do not work alone. They are the uh, effector of bigger machines. So in the case of replication, it's associated with the Bloom helicase and with a scaffolding protein called RMI1. And the topo 3 alpha works on DNA while RMI1 and Bloom locate the topo 3 when it needs to act. What's ongoing now, there's a lot of work on R loops and TDRD3, fragile X uh, proteins, which are RNA binding protein. In that case, the topo 3 beta is brought to the RNA through the TDRD3 FMRP complex and then can decatenate or work on the RNA at that stage. So the two topo 3s have different partners that divide their job in the cells towards the DNA and the RNA, replication, and transcription. And especially for the topo-3s, uh, it's very clear now that if the topoisomerases are imbalanced, that leads to genomic uh, instability and human diseases. So I listed why is it? Because the topoisomerases that normally work seamlessly can get stuck, not by drugs, but in the course of normal physiology. So in the case of TOPO1, during replication, a TOPO1 cleavage complex can be converted to a double-strand break by replication collision. That can form, especially if the TOPO is stuck on an abasic site. The TOPO2, eventually, the cleavage complexes, like your NIH gates, if you really pull hard, uh, the gate will really dis be disjoint, and then the DNA makes a double-strand break, and that would lead to recombination. Uh, collision with helicase and polymerases with the if the topo cleavage complexes don't go fast enough the polymerases will collide and that will create a kinetic problem and if you don't have enough topo isomerase you could be left with supercoil with knots or with catenates and all that will be very toxic so this is a, a, a list of the different endogenous lesion in addition to drug, that will form the uh, topoisomerase cleavage complexes. 
So when you have oxidized lesion of DNA, ABA6 sites, carcinogenic adduct, banspirin adduct, tobacco product, this will trap topoisomerases, and that will be then a problem for the genome. NICs, DNA breaks, UV lesion, ribonucleotide incorporation, which are very frequent, will lead to topo-1 engagement on DNA. Natural food products uh, also do this. Flavones, uh, genetic defects could be unrepaired, and transcription activation. So for instance, in the case of topoisomerase 1, the topo-1 will relax DNA very quickly. This is normally reversible. But if the DNA polymerase catches up, normally it should not catch up, but if this goes too slow and the polymerase goes faster, it will collide. This will generate a double strand end, and eventually the forks will revert. So these are the chicken foot. So these lesions could be very toxic. And the human diseases linked with topoisomerases are clear now, and they are coming up. For topo-1, there are neurological diseases due to lack of removal of topo-1 cleavage complexes. And this is mostly when the DNA repair enzyme for topoisomerase 1 are defective, like TDP1. For topo-2b, topo-beta, chromosome translocation uh, that, gener that are, are the source of leukemia or prostate cancer could happen if the topo-2b cleavage complexes are not uh, reversible enough. Topo-3, neurological disorder, schizophrenia, cognitive impairment. There are people in Finland, there's a group of, of patients, of people who have high frequency of uh, mental retardation and schizophrenia. And it was found that they have a deletion on the topo-3 beta gene. Uh, there's a recent paper of focal epilepsia in patients in, uh, in Tunisia uh, where it was found to be related to lack of topos 3 beta because the neurons just have these problems. They do have this RNA topology problem. And the repair enzymes for the topos, the two TDP, I'll just describe very brief, briefly now what they are, give rise to diseases in humans, spinocerebellar ataxia and peripheral neuropathy, and TDP2, intellectual disabilities and seizure ataxia, because if the topoisomerase cleavage complexes are not removed, that will damage the genome. So how are they removed? So what I told you before is that the topo, when they cleave DNA, when they relax DNA, they go through this covalent intermediate, which is normally very reversible. You see this arrow goes back this way. But if they are caught in the act, you'll end up with a covalent DNA complex. The DNA protein crosslinks. So all topoisomerases form a catalytic intermediate consisting of a covalent bond between one end of the break they make in DNA or RNA, either the three prime or the five prime, and the catalytic residue. And if this is frozen in that situation, you generate a massive problem on your genome. What are the solutions? So here I drew the uh, topo-1 cleavage intermediate linked to the 3' end of DNA, or a topo-2 cleavage intermediate linked to the 5' end of DNA. Nature has developed specific enzymes to hydrolyze the bond between the topo isomerase and the DNA. And these enzymes, the first was discovered here at NIH in building 35 by Howard Nash. So Howard called it, and we, we discussed that at the time, tyrosyl DNA phosphodiesterase. It's a mouthful, but it describes what it does. What the enzyme does, it'll cleave the tyrosyl of the topoisomerase, it will hydrolyze, and it's a phosphodiesterase, and it will liberate the topoisomerase and regenerate the DNA. So that's why it was called tyrosyl DNA phosphodiesterase. And Initially, I asked over it, I said, well, do you want to call it one? He said, well, you never know. So for some years, it was TDP1, there was only one TDP. But some years later, the second TDP was discovered in the UK uh, by Keith Caldecott, and then was called TDP2, because that one cleaves the topo2, and it cleaves in the opposite polarity. So now there are two enzymes which, as I said, are essential because if they are defective, you get neurological disease because the topoisomerase gets stuck in neuron, 
and a lack of these enzymes will, will lead to these diseases. But as everything which is important, cells have backup. And there was a recent paper by Shunichi Takeda in PNAS demonstrated very clearly that MR11 is a backup pathway for TOPO2. So if TDP2 doesn't do the job, then what would happen is the TDP2 will do it, the MR11 will do it, and same for TOPO1. So at the end of the day, for both the TOPO1 and the TOPO2 cleavage complexes, you have very specific surgical instruments, which are the TDPs. So TDP1 for TOPO1 will surgically excise the TOPO1 at the tyrosyl bone, TDP2, the TOPO2 at the tyrosyl bone. But in parallel, cells will use other enzymes to actually chop the flap. And these are the endonuclease. So TDP1, in fact, turns out to have a large range of function well beyond TOPO1 because it's a three prime cleansing activity. And TOPO2 is also involved in some viruses to rem as a VPG unlinked case. So these TOPO2 repair enzymes turn out to have additional functions. So putting it back now in the case of TOPO1, you have the two pathways that can act in parallel or maybe depending where things happen in the genome. TDP1, which is actually coupled with PARP, and the XPFERCC1 MR11 get given nuclease. And for me, what's interesting is this creates another synthetic lethality uh, possibility because if you take a cancer uh, and then if you block with a PARP inhibitor, TDP1 will not work. Cells will only depend on XPFERCC1 or MR11, and that's a synthetic uh, lethality uh, situation if a cancer is deficient in MR11 or is deficient in XPFERCC1 then a PARP inhibitor would synergize a TOPO1 inhibitor selectively in the cancer cell. I still try to convince the clinician to find the tumors, and they are not so rare, that are MR11 deficient or ERCC1 deficient to do a combination TOPO1 inhibitor with PARP inhibitor, uh, and then that should be synthetically solved, but that's a prediction. So I'd like to, uh, to summarize what I told you. All the chemistry work uh, and that led to the clinical development of our own, our, our own TOPO1 inhibitor that are in the clinical center now. We're done in collaboration with Mark Cushman uh, at Purdue University. So this has been a very long-standing relationship. Uh, uh, Jim Dorosho, uh, who is the director of translation research, is working together for a long time. Without Jim, I think the, the adenoisoquinoline would not have gone to the clinic. So I'm really grateful and all the, these drugs were discovered by Ken Paul. This is all teamwork through the N NIH and the NCI. And I've told you about uh, uh, Howard Nash, about TDPs. I mean, this has just been a fantastic work. And now, fantastic work as well now with Andre Nussensweig in our building, who has become interested in TOPO2 and what it does to the genome. So I'd be happy if you people have questions who are present uh, to ask answer some of them. Thank you. Yeah, you would have assumed that that should be uh, pretty good, but actually it's not synergistic. It's actually somewhat antagonistic because the TOPO2 inhibitor block replication, and when you block replication, the TOPO1 inhibitors are not very active because what the way the TOPO1 inhibitor kill cancer cell is mostly when they are replicating, um, you, you, you block the TOPO1, the, the replication fork collides into the blocked TOPO1 cleavage complexes, and that's how they are killed. You put the TOPO2 inhibitor, the cells stop growing, and it's as if TOPO1 is not <laughs> useful anymore. So it, it was a good thought. We tried. It didn't work, and we came up with an explanation. But, um, but good combination for TOPO1 inhibitors, it, it, explosive combination is with PARP inhibitors. It's explosive, uh, almost too much. And then with ATR inhibitors. So all these are in the clinic. We have in the in, in a clinical trial now with topotecan with the, the ATR inhibitor, and the responses are actually better than we expected. So I'm pretty pleased. But PARP inhibitors are so very, very synergistic. But TOPO2, TOPO1, no, oh, doesn't work. Is that a word? Is it 
Okay, thank you very much. Okay. So Kirk, he's the chief of the Laboratory of Use of Human Carcinogenesis. He got his MD from Kansas University School of Medicine. Then he did an internal medicine training at UCLA. And he's won numerous awards, such as the AACR Princess Takamatsu Award. And he's editor-in-chief of the journal Carcinogenesis. And today he's going to lecture us on lung cancer Precision Medicine Strategy. Kurt. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Glad to be here. Glad to see some of you. Um, so let's get right into it. So precision medicine was uh, coined and developed by Francis Collins and uh, Harold Varmus, um, actually now a number of years ago. And uh, that has led to lots of interest and funding in terms of cancer research. The kind of uh, medicine that I originally uh, learned was uh, traditional medicine, which includes uh, taking a, a history, medical, lifestyle, and family history, signs and symptoms, and then doing some standard laboratory tests. The precision medicine is multi-layered, it's individual-centric, and it's interconnected and the utilizes various omics which are listed here built on a foundation of clinical uh, information and epidemiological uh, data. So this is a more uh, extensive uh, uh, picture or cartoon of what is going on. So the information columns, uh, commons with all of the, in, the omics leads to a knowledge network and a new molecular taxonomic classification of individual patients. And this is to guide and uh, improve uh, clinical medicine. Uh, it's also uh, to inform biomedical research, and there's feedback mechanisms here, for example, and there, uh, inform mechanistic studies, enrich the information commons, and we added uh, a few years ago now um, uh, prevention uh, research. So let's go uh, focus on uh, lung cancer. Obviously, all of you know that lung cancer is largely caused by tobacco smoking. And this is a uh, interesting uh, uh, report and summary of the causes of death, of premature deaths due to smoking in the 50 years since the discovery of, of uh, tobacco uh, and cigarette smoking and, and lung cancer. And it's not only lung cancer, but it's multiple kinds of disease states. And you put it all together, it's close to 21 million people who've had premature deaths to smoking tobacco. And uh, some of you are much too young to see the television program in uh, the news program in which nine, I think it was nine, uh, CEOs of tobacco industry stood up and said that tobacco does not cause disease. That was um, a, definitely an understatement. Uh, cancer specifics, uh, this is a little bit old, but the good news is that the male, uh, in males, uh, lung cancer is going down in incidence. In female, it looks like it's plateaued off it's still in a plateau in the recent uh, four or five years, too. So it's a serious problem. Uh, it's due to smoking. The uh, United States has been quite good, and Canada, in decreasing the amount of, of smoking per person. Uh, it used to be like it is in the Soviet Union and some, some areas of, of Europe, uh, in which there's 35 to 60 packs uh, a day. Um, <laughs> not a day, a week, and um, that's cigarettes, isn't it? Okay, uh, and uh, that's deaths associated with, uh, with those. Um, so there's been some uh, prevention that's, that's been accomplished in some parts of the world, including the United States, but it still is the major cause of cancer deaths in the world. And uh, this has uh, increased uh, in more 
mortality up to about 1.5, almost 2 million now uh, in the latest uh, census uh, and of uh, um, lung cancer. And uh, in worldwide, second is liver cancer, primarily in Asia and the other cancer types. So um, a number of years ago, in fact, it was 1981, there was a meeting in Greece Cape Sonian, in which the very first report of uh, secondhand smoke or environmental tobacco smoke causing cancer was presented by here, Professor Hirayama. And this actually is a watercolor that he uh, uh, made. And um, I will say that uh, it was an audience of maybe 400 to 500 people, all physicians, scientists types, all studying cancer, and, and uh, at least half of the, the group did not believe him. But uh, he was absolutely right, and now there are 70, 80 studies that have shown that uh, exposure to cigarette smoke increases your risk of developing lung cancer. And since it was in Greek and Greece, uh, I like some of this flowery language by Hippocrates, obviously an English translation. Some men have constitutions that are like wooded mountains, men and women, uh, running with springs, uh, others like those with poor soil and little water, still others like land rich in pastures and marshes, and yet others, the bare, dry earth of the plain. Well, I was sitting at that meeting, and I thought, well, that was an interesting presentation. How could I maybe make a contribution to it? And what I wanted to do is ask the question of whether or not exposure in utero and in infants by their parents who were smokers might cause cancer in never smokers. And um, I had to wait 30 years or more because women didn't start smoking till the Second World War. And uh, so it takes 30, 40 years, 50 years sometimes, to uh, get uh, lung cancer. But one of our fellows actually uh, took a, the, the, this on. We published this in about uh, nine years ago. And the hypothesis was that childhood exposure to secondhand smoke and genetic alterations and in innate immunity increased lung cancer risk in never smoker adults. And never smokers are about 10 to 13% of the people coming into our clinic today. The conclusions of that study was that parental secondhand smoke, either parent or both, uh, exposure in childhood associated with a dose-dependent increase in lung cancer risk among never smokers in two different cohorts. And this was especially true in those individuals who had a, a mannose binding lectin haplotype which is involved in innate uh, immunity and uh, complement uh, uh, metabolism. Uh, and they have a hyper innate uh, immune system. That's about one fourth. So there's three or four people or more in this room that probably uh, have this uh, inherited um, condition. And the other interesting thing, and it actually it's very surprising, that in this study with these two cohorts, the, the never smokers were getting uh, cancer, lung cancer, uh, in their 50s and early 60s instead of late 60s and 70s. So uh, now let's go to the expososome. This was coined by the former director of the environmental of, of the International Agency for Research on Cancer, Chris Wild. And we're all familiar with using the external environment including tobacco smoke, infections, and so on and so forth. But he also included the internal environment that was directly related to the external environment, such as obesity, chronic inflammation. And these two together uh, can be used for developing cancer biomarkers of risk and, and uh, prognosis. Well, the cancer genome, obviously, is quite interesting and important, especially in cancer therapy, but it also, uh, and driver genes, but uh, it also is important in genetic susceptibility. And the understanding of carcinogenesis adds to these to develop ways of cancer prevention and screening strategies, and I'll end up with that in a moment. 
All right, uh, genome. Well, uh, the traditional view of uh, cancer when I was initially taking care of cancer patients was uh, small cell, squamous cell, adeno. And then in 87, it was discovered, uh, KRAS was discovered. And um, in 2004, uh, a number of EGFR mutations were discovered. And then uh, there was a number of uh, uh, mutations that are targetable, most of them, that were discovered uh, largely in, in around 2014. So the uh, genetic landscape of uh, lung cancer is fairly well known at this point, and some of these are targetable, uh, and I'll get in more into to that uh, later. Well, there are a number of chemical agents that cause cancer, and this goes back all the way back to chimney sweeps and scrotal cancer with the exposure uh, to uh, uh, smoke from, from wood and carcinogens such as benzpyrene. And uh, secondly, a dietary carcinogen such as Aspergillus flavus, which is produced by a fungus, uh, it produces aflatoxin by, by a fungus that grows and is imp important for liver cancer. And then, of course, cigarettes. Cigarettes is a witch's brew of, I think, 70 different known chemical carcinogens now. Um, but some of them are benzene, uh, formaldehyde, acetaldehyde, and of course, uh, benzpyrene and a number of uh, nitrosamines. Well, in the chemical carcinogenesis uh, of uh, lung cancer and other kinds of cancers, the first development was when in the 70s, in which uh, it was uh, concluded that most carcinogens actually are mutagens. Not all mutagens are carcinogens, but most, not all, carcinogens, chemical carcinogens, are mutagens. And there were rapid tests that were developed by Ames and others to identify uh, potential carcinogens and that had important regulatory effects in, in also smoking. And then uh, there were a number of very excellent reviews, including by Charlie Heidelberger, who also discovered uh, 5-FU, which is still used in our clinic 50 years uh, later. And then uh, our group uh, was looking at mutagenesis in uh, using human, human tissues and human cells. And then the next uh, era was in the 90s, uh, in which uh, it was discovered that uh, P53 mutations were linked to environmental carcinogens. I will say that David Lane's giving a talk here on Thursday, who's the co-discoverer of P53. So if you're really interested in P53, I'd recommend that you go to that talk in Building 35. Uh, our group and Austerk's group found that there were uh, specific mutations associated with aflatoxin exposure and hepatocellular carcinoma in China and also in South Africa. And that led to lots of other studies looking at uh, ultraviolet light and, and uh, various other carcinogens that we are exposed to. And the, um, this is a, just a summary of some of those carcinogens that that are targets various uh, tissues, that uh, cause uh, different kinds of mutation at various hotspots. And almost all of these are hotspots that have gain of function. The most common uh, uh, mutation in human cancer still is P53. In, uh, in ovarian cancer, it's about 95%. In squamous cell carcinoma in the lung, it's about 70%. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of continued interest in uh, P53 uh, and its mutations and their significance. As I mentioned, some of the mutations are gain-of-function mutations. So it switches from a, it's a Jekyll and Hyde kind of situation. It switches from a tumor suppressor to an oncogene. And this is just a cartoon saying that, that uh, loss of one allele of the P53 gene you lose some of the oncogenic, uh, excuse me, the wild type tumor suppressor activity. Some of the mutations uh, are null or still have some wild type activity. A loss of the entire uh, gene 
uh, is, uh, has, uh, is associated with increased risk of cancer, and various mutations uh, are at very high risk of developing uh, cancer. Uh, P53 is involved in many different uh, processes, as shown in this uh, hallmark-like uh, slide. Uh, there's germline mutations in the leaf armini syndrome. These kids uh, start getting uh, cancer at a relatively early age, sarcomas and a variety of other kinds of, of cancers. Uh, and uh, mutations uh, can affect etiology. I just showed you some slides of that. I'll show you some evidence that P53 mutations, at least certain types, would cause a decrease in prognosis. They also cause uh, changes in tumor metabolism. Uh, the mucosa barrier, and I'll say something about the microbiome, uh, is uh, integrity is uh, diminished uh, with P53 mutations. There are checkpoint uh, uh, cell cycle, DNA repair, apoptosis uh, that's involved with P53. Certain microRNAs uh, are um, uh, upregulated by wild-type P53, which is a transcription factor, but is uh, not uh, by uh, mutants, and, uh, of course, uh, aflatoxin, which I mentioned in, in, in inflammation. Now, most recently, there's uh, quite an interesting studies by uh, Alexandorf and Mike Stratton, who are at the Sanger Institute. Uh, Alexandorf is now at uh, San Diego at UC. SD, and they are looking at and have been looking at uh, trinucleotide uh, signatures. And uh, they published in 2000, I guess, 13 or so, there are about 20 some signatures, and now it's up to about 30. Some of them are associated with aging, such as signature one and signature five. Some are associated with DNA repair processes and inflammation, such as APOBEC, uh, and the green things are here. Some are associated with other kinds of germline mutations. Smoking, these three bright examples, these are different kinds of lung cancer, and it goes on and on. And so uh, there's a lot of interest in really defining what these various other mutations are or signatures are and what their role in cancer. And that's one of the things that's been considered to be added to the TCGA, which is the COSMID uh, a mutation uh, a database. Requires a whole genome sequencing, and that's really expensive. But uh, of course, the people who do those kinds of things would very much like that to happen. Uh, if you compare smokers versus non-smokers, uh, you see the signature four, which is in blue. There's more mutations that occur per uh, megabase of, of uh, DNA than in never smokers. Uh, so you might think, well, maybe there's more neoantigens available in smokers than in, uh, in, in uh, non-smokers. Uh, that remains to be uh, uh, proven, and that they might be more susceptible to, to immunotherapy, which, of course, is a a major topic at the moment. This signature, like uh, the P53 mutation uh, caused by benzpyrene, is uh, uh, found in smokers and found in mice that have uh, humanized, humanized the mice with P53. And you can take human cells and expose them to benzpyrene. So this is the kind of evidence people use for linking a particular agent, a carcinogen, for example, or a drug, or some environmental agent uh, with uh, these mutational signatures. Now, I mentioned uh, prognosis early on, and uh, this is a Kaplan-Meier plot, 100% survival, 0% survival, and this is time in months, so this is five years. So the red line are certain hotspot mutations that are gain of function. And they're also in various kinds of assays, and they're also showed, associated with poor prognosis. So it's not benign to have a P53 mutation. It can increase your cancer risk, and it also 
can uh, change your response to uh, immunotherapy, and that's been shown now in melanoma, and people are investigating that in other cancer types. Chronic inflammation has been recognized uh, since the uh, 19th century, 18th century, maybe even, yeah, 18th century, as being involved uh, in different kinds of cancer. It can be largely inherited uh, more than acquired. And hemochromatosis is an example of that. That's an iron overload disease, Crohn's, and also colitis or inflammatory bowel diseases. And pancreatitis is uh, familiar pancreatitis is associated with uh, 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 pancreatic cancer. And, and Carter's family, uh, the President Carter, uh, most of the people in his family uh, in the last generation have died of pancreatic cancer and have had uh, familiar pancreatitis. He does not. He has a, a metastatic melanoma right now to his brain, but it's under uh, therapy and for over a year now, and he's in his late 90s now. So he's a very fortunate individual. More frequently, the, the uh, infections uh, are acquired more than inherited. They can be viruses. They can be uh, uh, various bacteria, they can be parasitic uh, uh, conditions, or uh, can be chemical, physical, and metabolic uh, conditions such as acid reflux and esophageal cancer, obesity, uh, multiple types of cancer, and of course uh, smoking. So the global impact of uh, inflammation and or inf infection is about two million, uh, and this is being updated at the moment, Two million uh, cancers uh, per year are related to infection, and other causes of in inflammation are associated with many more cancers per year, such as I said uh, now, uh, smoking, and uh, up to over six million cancers, not only lung, but other cancer types too. Well, inflammation, uh, we've looked at a number of different pro-inflammatory cytokines and conditions that might have an effect on increased risk. And uh, in European Ameri Americans, that's uh, EA, uh, and Afro-Americans, AA. So this is a prospective study uh, that uh, we and other people have analyzed uh, for looking at the chronic uh, reactive protein and IL-8. There were very few Afro-Americans in that uh, prospective study. Uh, but in studies of, for diagnosis, we've found that both of these are increased in European Americans and Afro Americans. And Afro Americans also have an increase in IL 1 beta, which is a pro inflammatory cytokine, and IL 10, which is an anti inflammatory cytokine. So it's a little more complicated when you look at uh, different racial groups. Uh, for survival, is associated with uh, these various cytokines and uh, uh, in uh, TNF alpha, which is a highly uh, reactive uh, pro inflammatory agent. And I've already mentioned manospanning lectin uh, 2 uh, in European Americans. Transcriptome. All right. Um, let's first look at microRNA. So microRNA is quite interesting. These are small non-coding RNAs that are evolutionarily conserved and regulate gene expression. I trust everyone in this room is either studying them or has studied them or knows about them. They were discovered by uh, Victor Amros primarily um, in uh, yeast in 1994, I believe it was. He'll probably win the Nobel Prize uh, in due time. And uh, the... Uh, protein output of hundreds, hundreds of genes are repressed by each microRNA, and destabilizing our message uh, also occurs, and to a less extent, uh, inhibiting translation of, of, uh, of uh, mRNA. In 2000, uh, Gary Repkin, who I think is giving a lecture here, or just gave a lecture here, if you want to hear more about the history and modern day uh, non-coding RNAs. He's a guy to go listen to. Uh, uh, and then it was related to cancer in 2004 by Carlo Croce with chronic lymphocytic uh, leukemia. 
And that has led to a lot of interest in microRNAs as biomarkers and as uh, causative agents uh, or changes uh, that are involved in the process of carcinogenesis and a variety of other diseases. So as you know, uh, microRNAs bind to messages. They can inhibit uh, translation of genes. But if there's a mismatch in the microRNA, this usually, when it binds to the message, leads to uh, instability of the message and uh, cleavage of it. So there are two ways of inhibiting uh, proteins being made, either by repression or by uh, decreasing the number of uh, mRNAs, but microRNAs can also bind to, to other proteins that are involved in, in regulating uh, differentiation and expression. And uh, as Croce originally showed, they can bind, uh, such as MIR-21 and MIR-29, to receptors and activate uh, receptors to cause an increase in IL-6 and TNF-alpha and inflammation. Well, uh, this is a picture of uh, Mizumo, who is uh, back in Japan, an associate professor at this moment in Tokyo. And um, the hy hypothesis that was investigated was that microRNA profiles were significantly different between primary uh, lung cancers and corresponding non-cancerous tissues among different histological types, and that proved to be, be the case. And uh, what Azumo found was that there was increased to MIR-21, I'll say more about that in a moment, MIR-155 and MIR-106, and a decrease in LET7, which had been previously found by Tak Takahashi and Frank Slack, uh, who I think will be here in January, uh, who's at Harvard now. Well, we teamed up with uh, uh, Croce at that time after we'd done the lung cancer stuff, and ask in six major cancers, which were the microRNAs that were known at that time. And there was only about uh, 290. Now there are maybe over 2,000 microRNAs that have been described. Which of those major cancer types, which of the microRNAs that were known at that time were overexpressed? And MIR-21 uh, was found to be increased in all of the major types of cancer. And it was shown that it was upregulated in 18 major cancers eventually, and it was a biomarker in survival of at least 14. So there's been a lot of interest in MIR-21 as well as the others, by us and others. Uh, this is a, uh, an example of a study looking at multiple cohorts again here in the United States, in Norway, and Japan by our group. And these are Kaplan-Meier plots. So 100% survival, 0% survival, five-year point is here. Above the, uh, the median, which is in red, uh, is here. Below the median, which is in green, is here. So in each of these cohorts, there was association with poor survival if MIR-21 was overexpressed. And these are just some examples of other kinds of cancers in which the same kind of thing has been uh, found. So what's the mechanistic underpinning of uh, MIR-21 and human cancer? Uh, first of all, it's amplified, gene amplification. And uh, it's been found that uh, in the, actually in the seventh edition of uh, lung cancer pathology, they recognize that this is an important uh, criteria in the pathology. Uh, there's decreased transcriptional silencing of various genes, which is shown here. They're associated with cancer. Uh, we showed that uh, EGFR uh, increases MIR-21, or KRAS increases MIR-21. They're in the same pathway, so either one will lead to an increase in MIR-21. David Baltimore and his colleagues found that uh, various inflammatory agents, cytokines, through STAT-3 will increase MIR-21. And I've already mentioned that uh, toll receptors that are involved in inflammation and cachexia and maybe other diseases can be activated by this microRNA. So uh, it's not surprising that it's associated with many kinds of cancers and also poor prognosis. All right, so we've looked at uh, uh, protein coding genes also and in an un unbiased way. 
And uh, we found that uh, uh, XBO1, which is an uh, exporter of uh, small molecules, in particularly BRCA1 that you're all familiar with, uh, which is uh, uh, inherited uh, in an effective way, increases risk of uh, breast cancer, but this is overexpression, and that's been shown to actually increase uh, mutation frequency. And HILF1 alpha also is involved with various kinds of cancers and, and, um, and hypoxia uh, and ischemia in the tumors, and a decrease in a tumor suppressor uh, gene. These were all associated with uh, poor prognosis in 12 independent cohorts. The first five that we looked at, uh, these were our studies, that was our studies, and these are looking at data from other studies. And then it was confirmed in stage one, again, we're primarily in stage one lung cancer, about that size, less than three centimeters, and uh, without evidence of metastases. And uh, these are various other studies that were uh, confirmatory of uh, what, what we found. Um, as I said, we're particularly interested in stage one of lung cancer because that's potentially curable. Uh, and 1B is a little bit larger. That's three centimeters to five centimeters in size, but still low evidence of metastases. But uh, this is just a meta-analysis showing that in relapse-free survival, cancer-specific survival, or even overall survival, there was an uh, association with uh, uh, the expression of these uh, genes. Well, I talked about uh, mRNA and then protein coding. What happens if you made a combination of the two? And so the hypothesis was that the combination of protein coding genes that are mechanistically altered in lung cancer, adenocarcinoma, and non-coding MIR-21 is a better prognostic classifier than either alone. And that proved to be the case in a Japanese cohort and a U.S.-Norway cohort, uh, that uh, the Japanese cohort was looking at uh, primarily uh, 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 cancer-free uh, uh, occurrence, uh, and uh, these are studies uh, in addition, we're looking at primarily cancer-specific mortality. But in each case, uh, high levels of uh, these uh, genes, whether there was uh, uh, microRNA or uh, protein coding, uh, led to a, uh, a decrease in, in survival. And the combination with MIR-21 was, in fact, even better in these uh, primarily stage one uh, lung cancers. So what, what's the principle here? The principle is that, in this case, non-coding uh, RNA and coding RNA, uh, when you combine them, because they're magnetically different from each other, you end up with uh, low risk if both are negative, high risk if either is negative, or very high risk if both are negative. And the principle is that they both uh, give uh, some degree of accuracy in, in, uh, in agreement, but they both also, each individual one, also uh, uh, leads to misclassification, but misclassification of different patients. Misclassification of different patients. And this further proof of, of principle of this has been found in colon cancer, esophageal cancer, esophageal cancer, lung cancer, and, of course, uh, breast cancer. All right, now epigenome. Uh, what's epigenome? Uh, epigenome, one aspect of it is DNA methylation, and this is Anna Robles, uh, who did these studies in our group at that time. And the hypothesis is that an integrated biomarker classification of stage one lung adenocarcinoma based on independent message, message RNA microRNA and D, uh, DNA methylation biomarkers would further improve the prognostic classifier. So taking three independent mechanistic and statistically uh, biomarkers together, would that give you a better result? And the answer was yes, but we already knew that their DNA methylation of lung cancer 
including stage one, had uh, some association with uh, lung cancer survival. And this is from uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Manel uh, Esteller, who's uh, in Barcelona. And uh, in his study of looking at multiple uh, sites of DNA methylation, he found that there were five different sites in which DNA methylation was associated with poor uh, prognosis in stage one of lung cancer. And this was validated in a second cohort. When I looked at these results, I said, well, that's very interesting, but maybe these are interdependent on each other. And maybe only one of these is sufficient to give you the accuracy that, that you need. And that proved to be the case. So multivariate analysis uh, led us to look only at HOXA9. And when we did, and we combined it with the uh, protein coding genes and the MIR21, uh, that we found that the combination of all three mechanistically and independent biomarkers gave you the, the best prognostic uh, uh, indicator of poor prognosis uh, in stage uh, 1A lung cancer and in 1B lung cancer. So uh, that was putting three things together, and uh, now we're putting four things together to see if we can even improve the accuracy of the biomarker. All right, microbiome, and I'll just touch upon this, but it's a very exciting, interesting area of research, not only in lung cancer, but colon cancer and a variety of other cancers, liver cancer, uh, Tim uh, Gredden, who's over in Building 10, and um, people at Hopkins have primarily have done the colon cancer work, and we've just done recently the lung cancer work. Well, the microbiome, uh, which was really defined by the uh, NIH uh, as a, uh, a director's, uh, NIH director uh, initiative, it went on for about eight years or so. And Julie Segre, who's uh, here, was one of the leaders. And they looked at different habitats uh, within, within the body, on the surface of the body and on the interior of the body, but all exposed either directly or indirectly to, to, the, uh, to the environment. And the microbiome isn't just bacteria, it's also fungi and, and, uh, and viruses. And uh, if you look at the, you don't even have to go look at the axis there, but if you just look at the different colors and the percentages or the distribution, you can see that there's lots of variation from one habitat to another. For example, from the nose, to the, uh, to the lung, the skin, so on and so forth. So different parts of, of the body have a different uh, composition of uh, bacteria and viruses and fungi, and uh, they are part of us and uh, are about uh, 10 times the number of cells we have in our body. So they're a large part of our body. So there are a number of bacteria and, uh, and viruses uh, that are associated with uh, 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 the changes in the microbiome. And this uh, relates primarily to uh, mecha me mechanisms associated with uh, colon cancer, such as, or stomach cancer, uh, H. pylori and uh, Fusobacterium nucleoma. Uh, nucleomum, which uh, can cause changes in autophagy, uh, uh, beta-catetin activation, inhibit NK, uh, just be, by, be on the surface of the cells. Uh, the viruses generally are intracellular, and they can activate oncogenes that cause inflammation. If there's a barrier breach, like I said, with uh, uh, colon cancer that has a P53 mutation, Bacteria gets into the mucosa, and this leads to a pro-inflammatory signal that can be either acute, which is uh, very good because you get rid of the bacteria, or chronic, which can be bad because it can cause inflammatory bowel disease, it can cause uh, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or can be involved in cancer. So what's dysbiosis? Dysbiosis is a term in which the mixture of different kinds of 
of microbes in a particular habitat is disrupted. And this occurs with antibiotics, it occurs with cancer, and uh, the most dramatic example is something called C. Uh, diff, which is uh, involved in uh, um, colon disease and uh, prim primarily with, uh, hemo in, in, uh, with uh, cancer therapy or chronic uh, in, uh, antibiotic treatment. And um, so it's primarily just one bacterium that is growing in spite of all the rest that are usually uh, lost. So uh, this is, can lead to a fatal uh, disease, and, and that particular bacteria is usually uh, uh, not very responsive to antibiotics. But the study we just published uh, a couple of months ago was the first one in lung cancer, and uh, we found that certain uh, taxa, uh, including acetovorax, were higher in both adenoma and squamous carcinoma. This is actually in the tumors and in the tumor cells, in smokers and former smokers than non-smokers, and that the group of taxa is significantly associated with squamous cell carcinoma, which is acetovorax was enriched in smokers, and that there was an association between acetovorax and p53 mutation in squamous cell carcinoma. This is an unbiased uh, analysis of the microbiome, and then using machine learning, a random forest, and other kinds of strategies. And so this was the uh, uh, study that showed that squamous cell carcinoma associated attacks are enriched in tumors with p53 mutations, which establish a microbiome gene interaction of lung cancer uh, tissue. And you can read that paper if you're really interested in, in the microbiome, and I would suggest that you should be, because if you're interested in cancer, uh, you're going to find that the microbiome is going to be influencing many aspects of the kinds of studies that you'll be doing. All right, uh, let's end up with the metabolome. That's tumor metabolism and production of metabolites. And um, the hypothesis that Maya, who's now at the FDA, and Evie, who's at Ohio State, did in our group, was uh, unbiased me metabolomics again. We'll discover biomarkers associated with risk diagnosis, prognosis, and therapeutic outcome of lung cancer. <clears throat> and in fact, that's what we found, at least in a couple of studies now. And um, one of the liquid biopsies that, that we've been studying uh, is uh, urine and urinalysis. And uh, so uh, Armstrong, this is not flowery language, uh, from a liquid window through which physicians felt they could view the body's inner workings, urine led to the beginnings of laboratory medicine. And you could go all the way back to Hippocrates, who supposedly, along with other phys physicians at that time, tasted urine in the diagnosis of disease in his patients. Now, when I went to medical school, which was also a long time ago, uh, we didn't have to taste urine, but there was urinalysis. And so we could tell someone had a lot of uh, uh, glucose in their urine uh, without actually tasting it. Well, using this as a uh, uh, liquid biopsy, and again, unbiased, and then using machine learning, we came down to four ur urinary metabolites that uh, would improve diagnostic and prognostic uh, prediction of non-small cell lung cancer. So it was associated with prognosis, and these are Kaplan-Meier plots again, 100% survival, 0% survival, five year. If all four of these were elevated, the, in, the patients had much poor prognosis than if three or two or one. The second kind of analysis is called the rock curve that looks at sensitivity and specificity. And this is uh, combining uh, them again. So uh, if uh, all four are, are uh, elevated, then uh, the area under the curve, which is a, a, a significant uh, a value uh, for making clinical decision, uh, was about, along with the uh, more clinical stuff, was about 0.9, which is uh, quite high. Um, the 
question that came, one of the questions that came up was, where was this uh, creatine riboside coming from? Well, we've asked the question initially with lung cancer, but now with other cancers, it comes out directly from the tumors itself and from cell lines from those tumors. So uh, it's much higher in the tumor than in the matched non-tumor area. And the correlation between tumor levels and the urine is quite uh, remarkable in terms of the R value and in the uh, significance. So let's end up with screening, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, a um, landmark at screening came in 2011. Prior to that, prior to that uh, it was primarily just a chest X-ray, which proved not to be very good at identifying small uh, uh, cancers. But then low-dose uh, 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 computer uh, tumor graphic, uh, uh, tumor graphic uh, screening developed, and in this New England Journal paper, it showed that compared to x-rays, there was a 20% reduction in, in uh, mortality by, by low-dose CT. This is a fairly large study, over 50,000 people, all smokers uh, between age 55 and 70. Some had x-rays, some went thin. That was the good news. The, the Bad news, but there's a high false positive rate of 96%. But it could detect the smaller kinds of cancers, including stage 1A and 1B. So again, 1A, lung cancer, no evidence of metastases by pathology, 3 centimeters or less, and 1B, 5 centimeters or less. But with many screening tests, false positives, a real problem, whether it's mammography or various kinds of, of, uh, of uh, biopsy tests, uh, there's high, high false positive rate, especially using liquid biopsies of various kinds. So if you just picture this as a thousand individuals going to a play, and they all receive uh, on an annual basis three scans. Each of these blackened areas would represent someone who actually had lung cancer. But all of these are people who did not have lung cancer. And this is a, a, a interesting problem for physicians who are helping the patients make decisions. And including, do you have a surgery or you don't have surgery? You have biopsy, you don't have biopsy. About 30% of uh, lung cancers that are very small, you can't reach by a biopsy. So uh, there's a lot of overdiagnosis, especially in private hospitals. So in some hospitals, 50% of the people getting uh, surgery with these very small nodules, which are called indeterminate nodules, are actually benign. So as the surgeons say, cracking someone's chest is not a benign procedure. Sometimes people actually die, and it certainly is a lot of pain and suffering associated with it. So one needs to improve uh, 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 low-dose CT screening, and um, it's important for many reasons, not only because there are a lot of people who are eligible for low-dose uh, screening, almost 10 million now, uh, but it's paid for by the U.S. government. So uh, both the uh, Medicare and, at least at this point, and the Affordable Care Act, uh, depending on what the uh, Congress does and what the election, I would suggest everyone votes very soon. Uh, uh, so it's paid for. So it's a very important uh, screening uh, program. Well, we've proposed that there are a number of ways of, of examining using liquid biopsies to identify people who are at high priority for screening by low-dose CT. As I said, there are many millions of people who are eligible, but at this point, their capacity to screen people is in the hundreds of thousands. So there needs to be some prioritization, if possible, 
And these are the ones that we uh, propose based on, on laboratory data. Once a scan's been done, the question is, is it a, a cancer or non-cancer? And I talked about indeterminate nodules. And then early diagnostic uh, biomarkers to improve in combination with low-dose CT uh, uh, are uh, one strategy. And then finally, you remove the tumor and uh, stage one lung cancer, particularly stage 1A, at the moment is usually not treated after surgery. It's thought to be curative, but about 25% of the people who have stage 1A lung cancer have a recurrence. So we're quite interested in identifying those patients who are candidates for adjuvant therapy, immunotherapy or chemotherapy, and using a variety of uh, prognostic uh, biomarkers not in the liquid biopsy, but also in the, in the tumor themselves. So the objective is to use a, a precision medicine strategy uh, to identify those 25% of stage 1 lung cancers that will recur and die of their disease, and to decrease the false positive rate, to decrease financial costs, uh, and uh, improve patient care and guide mechanistic studies. So right now, uh, stage 1A, uh, as I said, uh, if it's low risk, observe, wait another six months and see if that indeterminate module, a uh, nodule, which is very small, if it grows or not. Uh, if they're at high risk, I re recommend that it be removed. So uh, that's, the, that's the objective of uh, screening and the strategy that we and other people are, are approaching it. And these are my collaborators, the fellows in the laboratory and colleagues, and these are collaborators, uh, people that we've had the opportunity to collaborate with, to learn from, and to hopefully do some synergistic research. So that's my story about lung cancer. Uh, that's not actually well done. And uh, uh, you can just imagine that it depends on the, the uh, uh, division in the cancer cells, the, the amount of apoptosis, the amount of senescence that occurs uh, in uh, tumors of various kinds. And, uh, but that will be done with, uh, with some of these indeterminate nodules that people follow for uh, a longer period of time, and then they, they determine that they are actually a stage 1A because it increases that indeterminate nodule, and then they can see whether or not it, it has progressed in a very rapid way or not. But it's a very interesting question and has uh, therapeutic implications. Sure. Yeah. So the question is, that are there other kinds of imaging, such as uh, PET scan? And there is, looking at glucose and other things. And that's a, a very rapid area of, of investigation. And people are, are asking now questions, can you actually scan the tumors for PD-1 and uh, identify those tumors that might uh, be more likely to, one, that they might be cancer, and then secondly, they might be more more amenable to uh, immunotherapy. So that's another whole field of, uh, uh, of uh, radiology that people are investigating here and elsewhere. Good question. We're done. All right. Thank you all.